Okay, welcome to Thursday, November 11th. This is our class session. And you are working on exam two right now. So the only thing on the agenda is your questions. So whatever you'd like to ask, that's what we'll answer today, but that's all I'm gonna to answer today. I don't have anything prepared to show you. You have exam two right now. You have it posted and you probably looked at it by now. Remember exam two is due by 11.59 p.m. Just as with our homeworks on Tuesday, November 16. So you know what you need to do, what, and you know, you, you're allowed to ask questions about the exam if you want, but I will answer them sparingly. And, you know, I'll answer them as I can, but maybe I'm not going to answer them completely or fully, but everyone has access to this recording. So if you ask a question, everyone has access to the answer I give. So that's fair, but the questions are really for you to work out. What can I help you with? Or what would you like to double check or practice while you're working on the exam? Uh, I, I don't know if there's anything you could say on this, but is there anything you could say about like generalizing a tangent plane from a gradient? Okay, I don't mind saying something about that. And, and then let's, let's put this on the list. The connection. between gradient and tangent. Okay, that's a very good question. I can give you a brief illustration and that probably relates to one of the problems. And when I say tangent here, you can talk about tangent line or plane. And so I have this saying that I like to use in a case like this, the gradient is the universal tangent maker. The gradient is like a Swiss army knife. It does just about, you know, I guess there are some exceptions, but it does just about everything. And one of the things that it excels at is creating tangent lines, tangent planes, whatever you're working on. Basically creating linear approximations. Okay, so that's a good question. We can probably find some examples like that. Uh, other questions you want to put on the board? No, I don't have any other questions right now. Okay, so that's a good start. Let's, let me give you a quick review of this. And I, I know what problem you're referring to. So you're referring to it three-dimensional problem, but I don't want you to overlook that tangent creates linear approximation in any dimension that you're dealing with. So the very first example someone ever gives you like this, then we'll give an example that maybe is closer related to what you're interested in, is let's make tangent line to circle x squared plus y squared equals four. Let's make it very basic at point one comma root three. Let's make it negative one, negative root three, just for fun. So you could do this in multiple ways. I'm just gonna draw a small circle here, not a large illustration. You know that this is a circle of radius two and minus one and minus root three must be somewhere in this area right here. 
if you like, we kind of assign a name to that point so we can use it in the drawing. Now the drawing's a little bit small. Now, you know you could solve this for y. And when you solve it for y, you're gonna have to admit to a plus or minus. And then you're gonna have to take this derivative, derivative of a square root. But rather, let's look at the circle as a level curve. the level curve of a function. This is a function of two variables. It's a circular paraboloid. It's an elliptic paraboloid, but it's perfectly round circles. And this level curve that creates this circle is the level curve f of x, y equals four. So this equation is the same as this equation. Now let's check out the gradient of f. Because remember the gradient of f is partial f, partial x, partial f, partial y. And in this case, the gradient is a two dimensional vector that reads two x and two y. But look at the gradient at various points on the circle. Like look at the gradient at x comma y equals two zero. The gradient of f at that moment, plug in x equals two, y equals zero to this expression, and you get the vector four zero. So that's a vector that's straight outwards like that. Let's try the point zero two and you get the vector zero four, which is a vector that's straight upwards. But the funny thing is, every time you check a point, the gradient, the vector called the gradient is normal to the circle, even at minus one, minus root three. You plug that point into gradient and you get negative two and negative two root three. It's not a point, that's a vector that says, go left two and go down two root three. Now, I'm not trying to draw to scale, but at that point, it's normal to the circle. And now you can do the tangent line. Because a line is an expression, ax plus by equals c, and the a and the b, or the normal to the line. So we'll do a more sophisticated problem in a second. But you just gotta remind you of the properties of the gradient. So when you first learned how to make lines, you focused on slope, but now we want you to focus on actually, when you're trying to make a tangent line, let's focus on normal. Because if you know the normal, you can create the line tangent to that object. Now here, you know the normal. So when you insert minus two for a, that's the a, x minus two root three, that's the b, y. You have a question about what point should, what number should belong over here. But that comes from the point you were given at this point, should I write seven here? Should I write 12? Should I write 13? Well, the number I should fill in right here is the number I get when I plug in minus one and minus root three for X and Y here. Otherwise, this point wouldn't lie on this line. So you plug in the minus one and minus root three, you get a positive two and you get a positive two times three. Two times three is six, positive two, positive six, this is an eight. So think about this and compare it to how you made tangent lines, even in calculus. It was somewhat tedious, say, oh, I got to get a derivative. Derivative tells me a slope. Slope and the point slope formula tells me a line equation that I have to simplify. Oh, here you found the tangent line in the standard form very quickly. I think uh, 
out of politeness, you should always simplify any expression you're looking at. And when you use standard form, you should always lead with a positive number if you can. Well, you can always do that. So I will divide by minus two everywhere. And this would be a nice way to present this line. So this is, sorry, my little energy saving device in my office went off. This is our final answer. But now, and let's pick out the book, a more sophisticated problem. Now you understand, say, wow, this is not related to the dimensions I was using. This creates tangent line or tangent plane or tangent object, whatever dimension you're in, in any dimension, just by using the gradient in two dimensions, three dimensions or four dimensions. You know, a tangent plane is AX plus BY plus CZ equals D. So now it's the procedure for all tangent objects. This is a valid procedure. for creating any tangent object. And when I say tangent object here, I don't want to be prejudiced and say line, plane, what comes after plane, hyperplane, or whatever people want to call it. Let's just call it the tangent object. If I was being formal, I would just call it the linearization. <laughs> so I'm going to go to section and let's pick out a non-trivial problem here. Oh, we're talking about chapter four. We're talking about section four, six. And let's pick out something a little more sophisticated. Then let's see if we can even illustrate it in Mathematica. You saw that on the exam, one of the questions involved having you illustrate some things in Mathematica. So a little more, I want you to get into illustrating things in Mathematica. Now, by the way, I could always, I could also use this in traditional tangent problem. Let's say f of x equals x squared. And I want you to make the line tangent to that x equals one. Well, how do I express that? How do I express that formally as a gradient problem? Because this is a relevant, this is a relevant observation. Here, this looks like a very traditional calculus problem. I want this tangent line at this point where x is equal to one. Well, first I have to visualize this function f of x equals x as a level curve. It is a level curve. This is the level curve y equals x squared or y minus x squared equals zero. So I invent a new function, capital F of x and y, and the function is y equals x squared. And this parabola, f of x equals x squared as a real valued function of a real value variable is now a level curve of a vector of a real valued function of a vector variable. So now I perform the gradient and I get minus two x and one. And I use the gradient at x equals one to find my normal vector. Now notice even x equals one is sufficient, but I need the x and the y value. The y value here is also one. So now I have my normal vector minus two one. Now I plug into my line minus two x plus one y. And I take this point one one and insert it into this line, negative two plus one, negative one. And so in a nice form, this is two X minus Y equals one. Now you recognize that 
is the same tangent line as y equals 2x minus 1. Okay, so even in a traditional sense, the gradient found the tangent line very quickly. Okay, so sometimes you see functions given traditionally, and then you have to find the tangent line there. So I'm looking for a tangent plane problem in four, six directional derivative. Tangent plane. Do, 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 do. Good, let's do one that has tangent plane and normal line and kind of a funny uh, function. And I'm gonna look at number 303 in 4.6. But then I draw your attention to problem 3.4 in 406. Sorry, I said that backwards. Section 4.6, problem number 303. Then I'll make a note. Also see problem 304. But let's just look at this. So two. So I want to find the tangent plane and the normal line to this surface. So, shifting my paper up here, find tangent plane and normal line. We'll illustrate both in Mathematica. Two, the surface x, y plus y z plus x z equals three at the point one one one. Okay, let's work this out. Now, first reaction is, I don't know what this looks like. Although, I observed that I could solve it for z. Do you see if you solve this for z by subtracting x, y, factoring out a z, and then dividing, you would create the equation. Subtract x, y, factor out a z, divide by x plus y. So that's interesting. There's an actual formula for this surface. But uh, it still doesn't help me see it. And do you want to do the partial derivatives here? To create the tangent plane in the traditional formula? Uh, I don't want to do quotient rules if I don't have to, although this doesn't look too busy. But notice that taking the partial derivatives here will involve quotient rules if I want to use the traditional formula, z minus z naught equals partial z partial x, x minus x naught plus partial z partial y, y minus y naught. There's the traditional tangent plane formula. Now let's rather think about this through the lens of level curve. So we invent a function of three variables. And the function is the one given to us, x, y plus y, z plus x, z, this quantity. And so our level surface will be f of x, y, z equals three. My camera is somewhat twisted here. So now, it's a good idea to check. Is this point actually on the surface? It'd be funny to create a tangent plane to a surface at a point that's not even on the surface. So that's always a good safety check right here. But you see, if you put one, one, one in here, you get one plus one plus one is three. Okay, next we execute the gradient. And the gradient is partial f. Here's my f, partial x, 
which is y plus z, partial f partial y, which is x plus z, and partial f partial z, which is y plus x, x plus y, y plus x. I execute the gradient at 1, 1, 1. There's a lot of symmetry here, so there's not much variety in this gradient. This gradient is 2 plus 2, or 2 comma 2 comma 2. But now I'm done. Tangent plane. Tangent plane is 2x plus 2y plus 2z equals what? Whatever makes that point fit on the plane. Put in the 1, 1, 1, I get 2, 2, 2, which is 6. So this tangent plane is x plus y plus z equals 3. Now I hesitate to sketch this because I don't know exactly what this looks like and I'm going to let Mathematica sketch it. But I also want to do the normal line. But I want to point out to you that the tangent plane and the normal line are really tangent plane, excuse me, a normal line are really the same assignment. Because if I have a surface over here, the tangent plane is determined by a normal and the normal line is determined by a normal. So again, this is an indication to you that you usually, you previously considered slope to be your end all and be all, but it's rather normal vector that's more powerful for us. So all I need for a normal line is a base point and direction, but I already have both of those in hand. Base point is one, one, one. The direction is two, two, two. Notice I could take the direction to be one, 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 if you like. But I'll write it as I wrote it. I think writing 222 two, two is a little bit obscuring the direction, but that's OK. This works. And this is tangent plane and normal line. Now, how this relates to the problem you're doing, you can decide. But all I want to say to you is the gradient creates normal line and tangent plane very, very quickly and smoothly, would we still be executing the quotient rule here? Uh, the other thing you want to say is, are you sure this tangent plane? How do you know it matches that? If I created the tangent plane this way, would I get that answer? So I think that's worth investigating. But first, let's do a little Mathematica magic and visualize this because not only do I want you to see it, but I kind of want you to practice making things in Mathematica. So I'm waiting for this document to open. And we're going right here. And let's supersize it and uh, I'll share this with you. Mathematica, we haven't explored its full power, although I've said this once before. Mathematica is really an entire document preparation system. Uh, let's say this is called section. So I'm typing text right here. This is section 4.6. Exercise 303. And I can type text just by looking at, maybe I should share whole screen with you for a second. Got it. And we're back and make sure you see what I see. I can do this by formatting a cell. So am I talking about a title, a subtitle, a chapter, a section, a heading, a text, code? No, I can use anything I want. I can control color and size of font. I can control type of font. 
So actually, Mathematica is used by many people as simply a document preparation system, kind of like Microsoft Word with a super calculator. OK, I'm going to pop out of that sharing just so I can focus on the window alone. And so what's the first thing I should do? I should get my space all set up here. How about by putting in the function that I'm talking about? And that was x times y. Make sure I'm doing multiplication and not a variable called yz. So you can do multiplication either with an asterisk or with a space. I'll do the asterisk so you can see what I'm doing. X times Z. So I've told Mathematica what function I'm dealing with. I want a level curve. So I'm going to do a contour plot. 3D, a level surface, excuse me. And the basic idea is I'm going to do F of X comma Y comma Z equals three. Notice the double equals for the mathematical equals. Uh, where do I want Mathematica to draw this? I really don't know what an appropriate window is, but let's try x comma minus two to two minus three to three, and we'll zero in. And I'll take that x range and do the same for y and z range just by cutting and pasting and changing variable names. Let's just do a raw picture. Okay, it's. Uh, some kind of surface here. Actually, what this is going to turn out to be is a hyperboloid of two sheets, but we haven't shown you how to rotate and translate those, just showing you the basic quadric surfaces. So the point 111 is somewhere, right? I want to add some decoration to this. So let's call this now that I know that I've got some output from Mathematica. Let's call this surface. And now let's press the output. And now let's say point will be list, excuse me, list plot 3D. And let's call a point right here. One comma one comma one. That's the point we're interested in. I don't know. I need, to, I need to type enter here just to see what I'm going to get. 111 must be a valid array or a list of arrays. What it wants is I've told it a point 111, but it wants a list of points. So I have to enclose that in braces again. Let's see if this is what I want. Uh, it is not what I want. So I need to recall, am I using this or is it list point plot? Maybe it's list point plot I should be using right here. But then, okay, that's what I should be using, list point plot. Good, so now I have my point and I could decorate this and style it however I want. Now let's create our tangent plane. And I'm also gonna contour plot this one because I have the tangent plane in the style of standard form. So what is it? X plus Y plus Z equals three. And before we execute this, let's just see that that command does create a plane. It's kind of a triangular patch. So I'm not, I like to think of planes often as square patches, but I don't want to be prejudiced. And let's do one more animal here. Let's create the normal line. Uh, I don't need to copy paste here. Let's call it the normal line. Will be a parametric plot. That would be an effective way to do this. Parametric plot 3D. And I will say, give a vector, give a list with the x, y, and z coordinates of the line I want to draw, one plus two t, comma, and actually that was repeated three times, wasn't it? Good, and my t range here, let's give it a t range minus one to one. Just a generic t range. 
And then we'll sharpen up this drawing any way we want to. Okay, so I'm creating a line. So I know that I've got these four things cooking. So now let's show the surface, the point, the tangent plane, and the normal line with show command. Surface, point, tangent plane. Notice Mathematica recognizes the variables I've already described, so it tries to complete those. And so it's not hard to enter that. And let's see what we got here. So this is really excellent. This is not a bad picture. The only thing I think I could improve right here is possibly coloring, transparency. I don't think I'll spend time doing that. I think I'll let you practice doing things like that. But uh, if I didn't have one-to-one -one units, I think I would want to do that. So my normal line actually looks normal, but this normal line does look normal. So I kind of like that. I think that this is a pretty fair drawing. Uh, the only thing way I could think of may, uh, possibly making this better is turning this tangent plane into a cute little square patch, maybe coloring the line, maybe coloring the tangent plane and the surface. Maybe I don't need this other part of the surface over here, but it's good to acknowledge the surface consists of more things. Uh, I'm not going to do a lot of decorating here. Maybe I could color the point so it stands out. But just to show you how simple that would be, let's pop in a contour style. And let's let the contour style be both blue and opaque. You could make it be blue, you could make it be opaque, but if you want it to be blue and opaque, notice that you put the contour style in a list that says make it both blue and opaque. Let's make the tangent plane. Okay, do I have my, I don't think, I wanna make sure I have this bracket not ending at the right place now, sorry. Okay, that's better. I don't, know what I want to do with the tangent plane. It's also contour plot 3D. So I use contour style. If I was doing plot, I'd use plot style. Uh, let's put this in here. Let's make the tangent plane be red and let's make the opacity be nothing. So just solid. And it's angry about my Z now because I don't have a comma right there. Okay, normal line just to display that to Make sure you understand, if I modify this, I have to say plot style, because this is not a contour plot. And so what do we want to make this? How about uh, green? Green doesn't show up well here in Mathematica, it's too neon. And let's make thickness uh, 0 0.05. This is probably a little too extreme. But now we re-execute, yeah, this is like, impaling the thing with a lightsaber. Okay, so uh, let's dial down that thickness. That's not bad. You know, I think I could decorate the point too. Let's see what decorating the point would do. Uh, let's make the point black and the thickness 0 0.4, although that's, that's a little bit crazy. That's way too thick. Okay, so it does not like that option. Oh, it does not like my double commas here. So do I have a little black dot there? I don't see a little black dot. Where did I put the little black dot? Should put the little black dot right there, plot style. I think I might have to use point style here. No. That's not working. Plot style. Let's make the thing stream extreme and then see what happens. Okay, so somehow I'm using the wrong option for my point plot here. I will drop it and let you solve that by looking up the options of list point plot 3B. Okay, good. Uh, 
Let me stop sharing this. And come back here. I am curious if I did it the straight ahead manual way, if I would get the same plane. Of course, I'm going to get the same plane, but maybe we should demonstrate that. But before I go crazy on this one, like, is this kind of addressing what you were asking for? You could say it vocalize, or you can go to the chat, either way. It's kind of addressing it, but I'm just a little more confused on how to apply it to the problem, but I don't think you can help me with that. Uh, and, and your question is fair, but you put your finger on it. You have to create the answer here. I mean, so since everybody knows the problem we're talking about, it won't hurt if I reference it. I asked you to calculate the volume of a tetrahedron and the tetrahedron had three triangle sides that were in the coordinate planes. And the fourth face of the tetrahedron is a tangent plane to a surface. So there's gonna be no uh, surprise if I tell you, you need to know that tangent plane. And you can calculate that tangent plane with the technique I've just demonstrated. But then how do you use that? That's up to you. Uh, I don't, we've already demonstrated. Maybe I'll say one more thing here because we've already done it. And so everybody has access to this information. So I think that's equal. We've already demonstrated that uh, tetrahedron of vertices A, B, and C in space has what volume? We actually calculated this once. Wasn't it one sixth A, B, C? Right. So it's a very special thing. So when you create your tetrahedrons, I won't make you recalculate this. You can use this as a fact. I won't make you like integrate to prove that that's the volume. So, you know, I think I got to leave it right there. You're going to create a tangent plane. Tetrahedrons look like this. It's kind of a funny fact. It sounds like it sounds a little bit surprising when I state it in the problem but it's an actual interesting truth and you're going to demonstrate that truth. Okay. I think you just got to frame, you just got to put your mind in the right context of the problem. And then the problem is not as complicated as it might sound. But just for kicks, I think I want to do, so let's put this under the category of remember. But just so people reading these notes aren't confused, but back to confirming our previous work. It's actually not hard to execute this partial derivative right here. So quotient rule says bottom times the derivative of the top but with respect to x, the derivative of the top is minus y, minus top times derivative of the bottom. Derivative of the bottom with respect to x is one divided by the bottom squared. Ah, this is, there's sometimes it's not worth simplifying it, but notice you have a minus xy and a plus xy. So if you sat down and simplify the top, what you really have is a minus y squared minus three times one, so minus three, and then x times minus y and plus xy are canceled out. 
So there's that derivative partial z partial y. If you go and execute that, notice that we've mentioned this once before, but we've not used it often to our advantage. Notice that this function is agnostic as in terms of the order of x and y. x and y, this function is symmetrical with respect to x and y. If I switch the positions of the x's and y's, I'd have exactly the same function. So that means that when I do the derivative partial z partial y, it's just a matter of switching the x's and the y's, but you can test this. At our x equals one and y equals one, these are partial z partial x, plug in this, I get minus four over four, partial z partial y, once I get minus four over four. We're just demonstrating this technique. And so z minus z naught times or equals partial z partial x at x naught y naught, x minus x naught. This is the formal definition of tangent plane just as a little reminder. And my x naught, y naught, and z naught are all one in this problem. So z minus one equals negative one times x minus one plus negative one times y minus one. And then you realize if you rearrange this, bring the x to the left, the y to the left, you have x plus y plus z and you bring the minus one over to the right, make it a plus one, you already have two plus ones over here. There's the tangent plane. If you had to create the normal line now, you would read the normal vector of one, one, one off this line, excuse me, off this plane, and then you could continue. So this is like doing the problem straight ahead from the basic definition or doing the problem from the universal tangent maker, which is the gradient. Okay. Kind of a basic remembering, but still worth remembering. So I like the question. Any other question I can answer for you here? That's all I had right now. Okay. Well, this is literally our review session in case people want to ask questions and people can email me questions or pop in or they can pop in and out. I will be here right now for the two hours and you're welcome to come or go as you like. Uh, but I won't make you like sit and stare at a blank paper. Why don't we call this the break time and again, come and go as you like, leave a question in the chat. I'll address it. I'll put the recording up as I usually do. But if the recording consists of 60 minutes of blankness, I'll write this on the paper so people go try to watch 60 minutes of blankness. This was strictly meant for your review. So, you check out your space, you decide what you like to do, but let's take an early break here and come back at 8.52 and see if there's any other question you'd like to look at. I'm gonna mute my microphone and stretch my legs for a second.
Okay, let's come back and just so I can give you something of value in the second half of this recording. And literally, I don't let, excuse me, I don't plan to prepare for the review session because this is your review session and your questions. But I will, uh, two things occurred to me over the break. And this whole question that was asked like, oh, gradient, tangent plane, things like that, you know, we did a calculation and an example, but I think you've noticed by now as you read the questions on the exam, okay, there's some calculation in there, but really your exam is testing your understanding of conceptual questions. And the further you go, the more often you're going to have to deal with this. And not have to deal with this as a penalty, but have to deal with this as a natural consequence of what you're learning. You know, I can say 50 problems of arithmetic and see if you know arithmetic. Two plus three, three times seven, four divided by negative 32. These are just calculational problems and I can provide plenty of calculational problems in the calculus, but really what you want and really what you need, you're not gonna pick up some object in the laboratory and there's gonna be a well-stated printed question on it, like calculate my volume using the gradient. No, you're gonna to have to look at the object. You're gonna to have to understand what it is you're trying to compute. Really out in the field, you're not told the questions. You have to form the questions or you have a goal that you need to meet. Now, I haven't gone quite that far in the questions here, right? But I am phrasing many things in terms of universal truths that you should understand and apply. So maybe application, it's an old word, but I'm asking you to apply your knowledge right here in a conceptual way. Do you understand the concepts? Do you understand the concepts of what you're learning? Do you understand the power that you have when you acknowledge the gradient as the universal tangent maker? So, uh, and, and it's not a punishment. It is a testing and a stretching, but it's absolutely what's gonna be required of you as you go forward, no matter what you're doing. So in that sense, it's time to level up and practice seeing the concepts and the questions, not just like, what do I calculate here? Okay, so that's an important point. I really like that. I really like your question because that points out that relationship. Next thing I'm gonna do here is I just also return this paper to you last night, really early this morning, as I was watching Love It or List It on, uh, I forgot, it was the Discovery Channel or something. It's kind of a fun program. I return this problem to you and the solution I posted is a correct solution, but I had mislabeled this interior sphere as having a diameter of two. Really, this sphere diameter is one and not two. So I'm gonna post that corrected sheet up there. That makes the radius of the sphere one half and not one as I labeled it. So in the solution I posted, the work is correct, but the labeling of this interior sphere was incorrect. I noticed that as I was reading your problems. Another thing that's interesting about this problem is that you can do this. Most often when I was reading your solutions, and if it worked out, that's fine with me, but most often you did this as, oh, let's calculate the mass of the large hemisphere, and then we'll subtract the mass of the inner sphere. Okay, that's possible. 
But notice you could also do this with one calculation by saying, I'm going to calculate the solid that goes through this air bubble and enters the solid on the sphere, which equation was rho, cosine, rho equals cosine phi, and exits the equation on the large hemisphere, which equation was rho equals r. And you could have written the mass of that paper weight with one triple integral. So I saw a variety of ways that you produce this answer and different ways that came out to be the same correct answer. That's very good. But don't underlook, don't overlook the economy. Don't overlook the economy of dealing with spherical coordinates here since everything was determined by spheres in this problem. That's not always available to you. That's fine. Just use it when you can. Uh, the other thing I want to say, although I won't do it right here, is could you create this graphic in Mathematica? So this is something else I want you to think about your future. And that is you are going to be creating and reporting to people that uh, may have a very limited knowledge of mathematics, not because they are lesser people, but because they have different jobs. So part of your skill is not just, oh, I can crunch the numbers, you know, you got to crunch the numbers and communicate and you communicate visually. And so you'd like to produce graphics to assist people in their understanding. So don't just report an answer to someone. Can you show them the answer? Can you help them understand the answer? Because you will certainly be reporting at some stage of your work to people who may not be as fluent with the calculations as you are. So you have to make sure they understand what you're doing and see what you're doing. That's another reason we're using Mathematica often to get you ready to communicate. Okay, so that's where we are. Uh, people come and go in the review session and that's perfectly, uh, you're perfectly welcome to do that. So welcome, Mr. O. Um, hey, I just had a question. Um, do you know if you can maybe do an example of one of the problems where you kind of like take an ellipse type shape and then use the Jacobian to convert it to like an R and theta? Okay, well, certainly I can. Do you have one that's a little more specific or point me to something? I mean, yeah, because okay. you want to know the volume of ellipse, because you want to know the mass? Uh, well, it's more like changing a 2D region of like an ellipse, an ellipse in a 2D plane, the XY plane, and then converting it almost to an R and theta using the Jacobian. And kind of like what you did in the last class session, except that was an ellipsoid in volume. Right, so it, and just, and I could look up a problem, we could do it now, but just to make sure everybody's memory is refreshed, we actually showed you how to calculate the volume of an ellipsoid by doing kind of a double transformation. Yeah. First turn the ellipsoid into a circle, then the circle naturally becomes, I'm sorry, ellipsoid into sphere, then sphere naturally becomes a little square. Uh, we'll yeah. look this up. This would be in five, seven or five, eight. And I'll suggest a problem. And then you tell me if that's relevant to you. So I'm looking in 5.7, which talks about those changes. I'm looking, did we do, kind of curious last time if we did 3.9.4. Let me just go back to my stack of papers here and make sure I didn't already do this. But I'm looking at problem 394. If you have your book in section 57, you tell me if that's relevant. 
No, we didn't. Uh, do you, if you have your book handy, look at problem 394 or 395 in section 57 and tell me if that's what you're looking for. Okay, I'm searching through the online book right now. No problem. I don't mind that online book, by the way. The interface is not as fast as I wish it was. So you can also just download a PDF, but then you have the static thing and you don't get their automatic updates of error corrections. Yeah, 394 is kind of like what I'm asking. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so. I will state it and uh, people can refer to it, but I'll just briefly state it here. And this is page. And so thank you for the question. And uh, someone had pre given a previous question that you can or anyone can check in the recording. So the previous question someone gave was more like, gradients and tangent planes. So here's the question. In the following exercise, use a transformation to evaluate this integral on the region shown in the figure. So here's the question in a, in a nutshell. Evaluate double integral or the region R of x squared plus 25 y squared with respect to area where the region R is this ellipse. So I'm gonna draw a small ellipse right here. The ellipse is x squared plus 25 y squared equals one, oh, I suddenly think this problem is a little too mellow, but, but we can use it as a starting place. And the ellipse, notice if you present the ellipse in standard form, you would say x squared over one squared plus y squared over one over 25, which is one over five squared. So in standard form, you read these as the intercepts plus minus one plus minus one fifth of the thing. So I'm not gonna draw perfectly to scale. But let's say this is a one fifth and a minus one fifth, a one and one. This is not to scale. But he provides a picture of the ellipse like this with these coordinates and uh, he draws this in the book. So I will say one thing about this problem. I do like this problem that it shows you that you can actually do calculating without doing any particular integration. So great shortcut, but I think I would like to see more calculation of this problem. So here's what we notice when we first look at this problem. Uh, this is an ellipse. I can set ellipse limits, you know, I could say literally x goes from minus one to one. And then every x I pick go from upper ellipse to lower ellipse with y. And solving this for y gives me upper ellipse minus lower ellipse. I could say square root of upper ellipse solve for y, uh, one minus x squared over 25 and lower ellipse, one minus x squared over 25 minus. And I could integrate rectangular coordinates with this successfully. And I would do it with a uh, trigonometric substitution, most likely like x equals one times sine theta from your calc two days. But I wanna visualize the concept more than the calculation. 
So I wanna take this maybe in two directions. I want to think of all ellipses as just squashed or stretched circles. So I think a circle is the fundamental object we should focus on. I'm not gonna do any commitments to names of variables yet. And then I want to take one more step in my mind. This is the one you suggested that, well, circles are controlled by angle and radius. So a circle of radius one is nothing more than allowing the R to vary from zero to one and the theta to vary from zero to two pi. Again, I'm not trying to draw to scale. So now I've thought of my ellipse, which has crazy limits as something which first has mellower limits, even in X and Y or in U and V. But now in the polar coordinates, there's very simple limits. So I've done no work yet, but I've said, okay, I think this is the way I should visualize the problem. And to do that, I'm gonna make two coordinate transformations. But the first one, even though it looks kind of boring, is actually the most important thing right here. How do I understand the ellipse as a stretch circle? Well, first I just say U was playing the role of X and X was already one. I could just say U is X directly, but V is the thing that I had stretched or squashed. Here, I had squashed it by a factor of one fifth to create this, but that's like saying V is five times Y. Now that's going this direction, but it's really important to realize that to calculate the Jacobian, you have to go this direction. You have to say X equals something and Y equals something. So you have to invert this transformation. When you invert this transformation, you, since it's a very, pretty simple one, X is equal to U, Y is equal to one fifth V. Sometimes the hard work is inverting the transformation. But now I can do the calculation of the Jacobian for this transformation, partial X, partial U, partial X, partial V, partial Y, partial U, partial Y, partial V. This is the Jacobian of this transformation with U and V. Notice that the Jacobian is equal to the determinant of this matrix, which is equal to positive one fifth in this case. And this is literally an acknowledgement that to go to my problem, I literally scaled this area by one fifth. You know that the volume or the area of this ellipse right here is pi times one times one fifth from the work we did previously. Okay, sorry, I didn't have my paper nicely set. Okay, now I, I do the same thing logically here. I know how to create R and theta. R is the square root of X squared plus Y squared and theta is the tan inverse of, I should say, y over x, but here it's v over u, and I should have said u squared plus v squared here, because I was coming from this uv land. But to do the calculation, I need to write this in terms of u and v, in terms of r and theta, but I know that well. r cosine theta, and V equals R sine theta. From there, I can calculate the Jacobian of R and theta. And I won't do this physical calculation, but we know this comes out to be R. Partial U partial R cos theta, partial U partial theta minus R sine theta. So this is just practice. Partial V partial R sine theta partial V, partial theta is R cos theta. If you work out this determinant, you get strictly R with a trigonometry. 
So now let's look at one more bonus. Simply having the limits come out nicely, and you saw this in the most recent homework problem in 5.7, that's really not much of a bonus if the integrand is a mess. And we created nice limits in the homework problem in 5.7, but our integrand was not friendly. And so there was still a fair amount of work to do, but it could be done with one integral. Here, I get nice limits, a little brick. I also get nice integrand because they want me to integrate over this region. But in this region, x squared plus 25y squared is equal to one. That's ellipse right here. So I think that this now is not whether it's just strictly equal to one here. I don't know because x and y range over the whole inside of the ellipse. So I don't just replace this with the square root of one, I'm thinking, right? So I got to do an actual variable replacement. But this integrand is friendly to this coordinate transformation. So now let's do the actual changes. And I think I'm going to have to sacrifice and move the paper up. But I will restate the integral. R square root of x squared plus y squared, uh, 25 y squared, dA, here my dA is in terms of x and y. I'm going to move it to, let's call this S for circle. I'm going to move it to S land. Let's make S land red. And then I have x squared plus 25 y squared is replacing the x and y. y squared is 1 fifth v, so 25 y squared is 25 times 1 over 25 v. We see this turns into immediately u squared plus v squared. Now I'm integrating with respect to the area element in the uv plane, but to pay for this, I put in the Jacobian of u and v, absolute value thereof, which was already positive. But remember, this says absolute value. This says determinant. OK, so now this is pretty nice. It's a circle. It's circular symmetry. In fact, what I want to say is you would write this green integral here without even thinking you would just say, oh, let's write it as a polar or integral. But now let's formally see myself make the polar switch. Uh, let's call this B for brick. And let's say that I'm now integrating over B and U squared plus V squared. I see my U and V transformation right here. U squared plus V squared is R squared. This is the square root of r squared, which is just an r. Remember, there was a one fifth present from our first transformation. And now remember, I have to insert the Jacobian of r and theta, absolute value thereof. But this is r. I don't have to slap absolute value signs on this if r is a positive number, as it will be for us. Now I execute the RD theta. And now I can actually write the limits of the brick B, 0 to 2 pi, 0 to 1. This is kind of straight ahead and not complicated, but you can tell me in a second if it satisfies what you wanted. And now I'm going to just write down the answer to this integral, but I'll let you evaluate it if you want. But we get. 1 over 15 r cubed, but from 0 to 1, that'll just produce a 1 over 15. And then that's a constant with respect to theta, so I'll get 2 pi times the 1 over 15. I'm expecting that the answer here should be 2 pi over 15. We could find, we should find some means to verify that. But what I want to say now is we have the answer in the whole space. 
do you see how little integration you did? And this is the value of the coordinate transformations. And I want to say again, that you would have done this coordinate transformation naturally in your head. You would have changed this to R, R d r d theta. I should write d theta here. But here I'm doing it by the coordinate transformation playbook. And there is a price for the coordinate transformation playbook. And that is you have to know the transformation both ways. But I won't make anyone build this transformation. I'll just consider it as one of our natural tools. I won't make you write the Jacobian for the polar transformation. I'll just let you call it R. Okay, so there's some utility right there. The integration actually wasn't trivial. It wasn't constant, but it was relatively simple. Is that what you wanted to see kind of? Yeah, and then also, so like, let's say like that circle was like shifted off, like it wasn't on, or it wasn't centered at the origin. Good. Then you could, you could just make like um, the expression like X equals uh, like U minus like the displacement in the X direction, right? Uh, I, I say you're clearly referring to a problem, which is no problem. I don't mind that at all. Uh, I will say that in theory, that sounds right. And that's probably what you're trying to execute. So what we just did is went from ellipse to circle to brick. And I think what you're asking is, what if the thing you're dealt with is not centered at the origin? Well, I think logically, but I'm gonna let people work this out. I think logically you're thinking the right thing. Oh, that's just another transformation. So you could go from ellipse. Do you, do you go to off center circle and then to brick? Do you go straight to circle and then to brick? Uh, you know, that's, something that you could consider. Don't add more steps than you need to add. And, and, there are min, and there are valid ways to take the steps. There's not just one valid way to take steps. But I think if this plan works, then I'll say this for the benefit of everyone so that everyone has the same information. This certainly looks like a reasonable plan, but I have to let you execute it. Okay, thanks. But, but yeah, everybody's uh, reviewing this recording later. We know that we're talking about one of the problems on the test. Okay, thank you. So uh, just a final comment on this. So this tells you how important it is to visualize things. And it also tells you what great flexibility you have when you think in terms of the big picture, coordinates and transformations, instead of just what are the limit equations. Okay, so you can do as people did also in the first hour. I'm just here to review and only here to review so you can hang out, you can throw up another question, or you can just go about your business and I'll be here till 9.55. In case I'm just recording blank paper, I'll make a note so people can scrub through the blank recording if they want to.
La 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 la.
Okay, here I'm going to unmute myself and end the recording. I have a couple of good questions. And if you have any other questions as you're working over the weekend, you can send me an email and I'll respond to it in the order questions are submitted as time permits. But I want you to have a good weekend now. I'll see you next week. Bye.